welcome to Beyond Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Petralis, and uh, I'm really excited for today's guest. Uh, someone who I'm a big fan of on television. I, I love their takes. I love their hockey takes, uh, especially with Felger and Haggerty. I, I think you do a great job and you, you have some great insight in hockey. It's fun listening to them. But um, someone who's pretty balanced. I think, you know, in the world of social media nowadays, you follow athletes and what they do outside of sports and that what makes you love them more. And I think for the people that cover sports too, it's the same thing. And I enjoy this guy's social media a lot. I think he's pretty balanced and uh, has a lot of fun. And uh, I'm really excited and honored to get on here today. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, from NBC Sports Boston, DJ Bean. Anthony, thank you so much for saying that. I must be, I something good must be going on. The vibes must be strong because I, 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 not to say like, oh, I keep running into people who recognize me, but I ran to a person today who was like, hey, man, like, he, he also used the word balance. And I was like, can you swear on this? Yeah, go ahead. Go for it. Yeah, go I was like, it. shit, I'm balanced. Cool. Okay. <laughs> what? I mean, I, I guess that just means that uh, we're all, We've all lost our minds in a, a, a lot of ways, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know like if I'm <laughs> balanced as much as I think we, we, we met recently and we were talking about this. Like I just don't take everything so deathly seriously that yeah. uh, it's, I don't know, I guess it's a little easier to be uh, a little more even keeled. If you're like, if you hear something that you disagree with, if you don't have a meltdown, which is becoming uh, kind of the norm. So I don't know. I just want to sit around and talk sports. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love it, man. And I appreciate you coming on here, and I appreciate what you do. And uh, as someone who's like crying the cracking into this, I mean, we're a high school sports podcast. You know, we cover coaches, we, you know, interviews like this, but we also cover teams like, you know, that behind the B all access hard knocks type thing in which, you know, you get the mm. cool little intricate stuff about high school sports that maybe doesn't get to be seen as much. So uh, you're rad. a different guest. And, and truthfully, you are, I've had two like special guests on here, like someone outside that world. And my first one was my 50th episode I had on the thrill ride. He was great. And then uh, you're the second guy. So it, it's been a lot of fun um, as far as being able to, to kind of get some fun people on here that I think will have my listeners uh, and obviously yours uh, really enjoy. So, you know, you mentioned we met, we met at idle hands and that was a lot of fun. Uh, and, and again, that's how we kind of connected this. So we're going to jump into a segment in our show and it's called the Cheney's two minute drill. It's like a rapid fire, quick questions, one Love or two that. word answers. Have you ever been to Cheney's before? It's actually right outside the Boston garden. I have not, but I'm always looking for new places outside of the garden. Okay, Friend Street, 252 Friend Street. Go to Cheney's. It's right next to the greatest bar. Uh, okay. Uh, to, in my opinion, I know they're known for their R and Cheney's, but I think the best calzone in Massachusetts. It's that like soft pillow. You bite into it. It's doughy. Um, and, and obviously, uh, calzone's a calzone, but the R and Cheney balls, mac and cheese, buffalo chicken, traditional pizza's perfect and joe spagnuolo the owner there is is the man so i'm telling you if you're ever at the garden you're covering these series coming up you gotta try it out it's unbelievable oh say no more i mean we so we met at a brewery and so much of the experience with breweries is like is the beer good is the place good are the vibes good meaning like are the people good is it run is it owned by or, or run by by good people so you just gave a hell of a sales pitch and i'm going to the celtics <laughs> game on i'm going to the celtics game on sunday so who yeah. knows maybe i'll sneak in a little calzone action you got to i'm telling you you won't regret it man and uh, ask for rizzuti if you're there rizzuti and he's telling oh, me yeah. straight gas he will he, he will absolutely love it he'll absolutely love it <laughs> awesome so we got a rapid fire here this two minute drill and again i'm just going to ask you rapid fire questions one or two word answers we're pretty leaning here if you want to explain a little further go for it and um again it's going to be a pretty balance of questions i think you'll have a lot of fun with it so cool i'll start the timer and here we go person who you work with who takes the longest to get ready whether that's hair outfit makeup whatever who takes the longest um i shoot <laughs> there's i don't want to let me see who does take the longest to get ready uh honestly it might be me i don't think that i do take that long but everybody's pretty efficient uh everybody is pretty efficient all right i love it i love that okay um person who who person who you work with who is like really accurate with insider information like when they say something they're right a lot more than they're wrong uh, i mean tommy curran phil perry all of our like Nobody, I don't know anybody who says anything that 
I know when they say it, I'm like, oh, well, I know where you got this from. This is just going to be that. So sorry, I just gave a super long answer, but no, that's I trust great. everybody hey. I work with. Where I trust we, everybody I work with. There we go. There we go. Song that still gets you like juiced up when you're at a game or when you hear it come on in a game, you're just kind of like, oh, this is cool. In the air tonight would be so cliche. Honestly, I don't get mad when I hear Uptown Funk. Okay. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, which like local and national sports reporter or commentator, who's somebody that you kind of really respect or like look up to uh, when you got into this field a little bit? Uh, Mike Felger, Rob Bradford, Michael Hawley. When I was a kid, I loved Michael Hawley. As an adult, I love Michael Hawley. But as a kid, I really <laughs> looked up to him. Um, now, it's not even close. Stephen A. Smith, he's the GOAT. Yeah, yeah, he he, he does. He gets funnier and funnier, man. Exactly. Uh, he's <laughs> he, he's the best. I, I could do 45 minutes on Stephen A. Smith. That's great. Um, are you excited for the three ring circus coming in town and the Brooklyn Nets and the Kyrie circus that comes with it? Absolutely. You get an Eastern Conference finals in the first round. Hell yes. I can't wait. I want to go to every game. And you're spot yeah. on. It is an Eastern Conference final. That team's healthy and has, you know, Kyrie all year without, you know, the, the whole COVID thing. Then, you know, that's a team that's one, two or three in the East themselves. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, most memorable sports moment that you've covered uh, at, a, at a professional sporting event. Has to be game seven of the 2011 Stanley Cup final. Game seven of, tw- of the twenty. 20- 11 Eastern Conference final can't be far behind game six of 2013 uh, of the 2013 Stanley Cup final game seven of the 20 now I'm sorry that all these are uh, are Stanley Cup final ones and mostly ones that the Bruins lost but um, yeah yeah the, a lot of those but I got a lot of memories man I, I was on uh, uh, one of the duck boats when the Patriots won one of their Super Bowls and that was really cool. That was th- that one stands out too. See, that's cool. I mean, I, I'm sure you have a zillion stories like that that are just like for someone like me, I'd be like, oh my God, you did what? You know, so oh dude, nothing is more <laughs> nauseating but enjoyable. Like I can hear us when we do that. When sports writers or sports reporters get together and just like reminisce and wax poetic and they embellish whatever thing happened a million years ago that they were at, and they say like and then so-and-so comes up to me and he sticks his hand in his face. It's like, and he didn't stick his hand in your face, but like if, all the stories we remember are like way more dramatic, man. I have a ton of stories. I have a ton of stories from that 2011 Bruins cup run. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a great story about that. I got married on game five of that series. Wow. And I remember, you know, as the Bruins in the playoffs and, you know, I was like saying to my wife, I'm like, you know, if everything lines up here, we could be in trouble. Like, June 10th is right around the end of the Stanley cup, you know, and this was back in like March, April. And she was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then just kept getting closer and closer. And then whenever they, you know, won that game against Tampa, I was like waiting for the schedule to come out. I'm like, Oh my God, this is going to really happen. And sure enough, it was game five, which was a game to miss, which was a game. I was going to say, where are you, were you (laughs) concerned that like, it's like, rain on your wedding day. Were you concerned that like the Bruins lost in the cup final? on your wedding day? You know, I have to say not really, you know, cause obviously it was just such a great day. Yeah. Uh, but it, I'll tell you one thing. It was funny. Like we had like a head table. So we were like a little bit of like higher up than everybody else. And to see all these guys just like looking down on their phones, like, I'm like, I get it. Like, I get it. Cause if this was not my wedding and I was sitting in their seat, I'd be doing the same exact thing, you know? So, um, but I'll tell you, yeah, it was, it was a game to miss, I guess, when you look at the bigger picture game, six, game seven. And, uh, but yeah, that, that's my funny 2011 story for you. Um, and I'm going to ask you one more question here, cause we'll jump into this later on in the podcast, but who has a better chance of winning a championship in the Boston garden this year, the Celtics or the Bruins? Uh, it's the Celtics, but only because it's definitely the Celtics by a million miles. Like yeah. it's not even close in my yeah. mind. I think that we'll see what happens with Robert Williams, but they have been, they are what they are the second half of the season. They are like the best team in the Eastern Conference. Again, they're going up against possibly the other best team in the Eastern Conference. So as far as I'm concerned, if they get out of the first round, I expect them to go to the to the NBA finals. And I don't expect the Bruins to get to 
I don't expect the Bruins to get to the, the cup final. I think this is, especially with the injuries racking up the way they are right now, I think they're right now the most formidable opponent you could get in the postseason is the Bruins injured list because right. every guy every, he just keeps growing bigger and bigger. And there's more uh, players about whom you have questions. So give me the Celtics for sure. I want both these teams to make runs. I really enjoy both, but I got a really good feeling and I'm very excited about the Celtics. I, I feel you. And I, honestly, I think the same exact thing. I think when you see Posh knock hurt, I mean, that's automatically like doof. Robert, Will- Robert Williams is obviously a tough loss too, but you know, they, they have stars around that, you know, they have better guys around that, but when you lose mm-hmm. your best guy and he's injured or banged up going into the playoffs and hockey's just so interesting, you know, hockey is really just matchups. Like, you know, you get a team that's quick and you're, and you're a smaller team yourself. Like you got someone who's like, you're going against yourself. Like that, yeah. that can be tough, you know? That's why they play the games, man. That, that, that's why I, I, I love, it's one of the best things about sports though, honestly, that like you could be built for whatever, and then you run into the wrong matchup or I'll take it way back to the 2004 Cardinals. Everybody knew the Red Sox were going to absolutely smoke that team because that team was built to cruise in the regular season. And then when it got to, okay, you need to have guys go, you need to, you need to have guys go deep into games. Like that team wasn't built to do that. So it's you're built for whatever you're built for. So if you're built for, if you're, if you're built to win matchup a, that does not mean that you're built to win matchup B. Yeah. And no, and, and, and I, you know, I find this, this year, like at least like, especially the winter sports here being indoors and being at the garden, it's interesting how these teams are both built, built too. you know, Mm -hmm. like Bruins, I, you know, when someone says all oh, the Celtics had such a big run and they did Bruins really did too. And the, I feel like if I had to pick between the two of them, I was more shocked about the Bruins just because they were like a one and a half line team that all of a sudden became a pretty balanced three line team as they were going through this run where the Celtics, you just knew they always had the potential to be really good. They just kind of had to figure out what it seems like some maturity things, maybe, or just learning how to play together out of a new system. But um, it's interesting how both of these teams are built uh, in, in the ways that they were built, you know? Yeah. I mean, being able to get away with Hala as a second line center it's crazy. is <laughs> a an enormous game changer that yeah. like seriously changed the Bruins fortunes and on the Celtics end you're right I think that maybe we were quick to see the same result a 500 team throughout the first half of the season and be like oh no this is like here we go again but we probably should have had cooler heads and considered that they're getting used to a new coach I'll make another reference to the 2004 Red Sox I remember a couple months into that 2004 season we were like wait a second is Terry Francona a bad manager too oh no is this the right guy and like sometimes these things do take time but man all I'll say is Tatum and Brown playing the way that they have and the team thriving the way it has with those two leading the way has just confirmed that people were right to be throwing up their hands earlier and being like how is this not working these guys are so good this should be great so I know there's some like spiking of the football with Oh, you still want to split up Tatum and Brown now? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, if people were thinking that it was because they were frustrated, it was because they expected it to be working the way it's working now. And they were seeing time and again, it wasn't. So I think that there is kind of validation uh, across the board there. Yeah. And, and I just to kind of maybe even one up that to a point, like, yeah, we, your, your whole team was built on this, right? Your whole team was built on the idea that you got back-to-back draft picks that you stole from Brooklyn way back when, and yeah. they made you so much better. And it's just like, right. An NBA life expectancy only goes for so long. And yeah, at one point you're like, if they're not going to play the way we think we can play, let's just get the highest value for them right now and try to start this over. And obviously thank God, <laughs> like, thank God, you know, people did it, you know? Oh yeah. I've talked to Lakers fans who are like, man, I really wish that you guys never turned that around and that you ended up trading like Jalen Brown for Anthony Davis or something. I and mean, I was think like, about oh. that now. Think about yeah, that. Yeah. Right. Now. Like imagine if something like that happened. Oh right. my God. We would have <laughs> never known what, what this team would have done. Yeah. So it's all interesting. And yeah, so th- that's good, you know, and to me, like, nothing like Brown Jalen Brown's video of just like, I'll take this team over anybody. Like to me, I watched that a zillion times and I'm like, he's talking directly to Brooklyn because they knew they won that game. They knew they were going to get the two seed. Yeah. Like 
let's go. And I was like, that was like the, probably the only time I finally got excited to be like, all right, I'm glad this is the first round matchup. Like there's a lot of stake here, <laughs> dude. You know what it was for me? I don't know if anybody heard this, but Jason Tatum was on Draymond Green's podcast a couple of weeks ago. And the pull quote was um, Draymond Green or like the, the headline, like the thing that everyone was talking about off of that was that Draymond Green said to Tatum, uh, if you don't win MVP, next year you're weak as fuck uh and that was like the big takeaway from that but i listened to that whole conversation and and that was said lovingly by the way but i i I listened to the whole conversation and tatum was talking about this team and like what it does well and everything and he was like man like a big thing i've been on a lot of different teams before he was like and he asked like i did earlier he said can i swear and grandma was like yeah say whatever you want and he said like our guys give a fuck on defense and draymond like was like excited about that because he was like man like when, when you have it when you have guy, like guys that like give a fuck on defense right that's that's another level and obviously the celtics are the number one defensive team in the nba so i suppose it's not a surprise but just like the way that jason tatum all galaxy offensive player is talking about like we defense. love playing defense like right. i was like okay then i'm ready to run through a wall right now present yeah. me with the wall i shall run through it and that's what, <laughs> and that's what you want to hear. You know, that's what you want to hear from like your young superstar. Because again, you watch the league. I mean, let's. It's all about the three ball, right? You're not watching mm-hmm. somebody who's like, oh, I'm watching this game tonight because this guy's locked down defense is this percentage and blah. Like, no, you're going to watch a game that both teams want to score 100 plus points and maybe even to the 120s and 130s. That's an exciting yeah. game, an NBA product that they want. And defense isn't as you know as. I guess, marketable or sexy, whatever you want to call it, but um, interesting. So I'll switch gears here for a second because, you know, I, I, I said I'm a huge fan of you on TV and and I think that your takes are great. And I think, you know, you add this like young perspective, I think, into the world of covering sports and asking questions that maybe people wouldn't have necessarily asked before as far as thinking of reasoning or thinking of why somebody made a decision or did what they did. Um, how do you guys like prep for a show? Like I, you know, here, like I do research on coaching I look on the internet. I look up max preps. I look up their record over a certain time, newspaper articles. I mean, you guys obviously have everything coming to you like that, but you know, let's say you're on Boston sports tonight, tomorrow night, right. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, how are you prepping for a show like that and getting ready to to go live? Uh, I will. I mean, the preparation is being a sports fan first and foremost, like I'm more than acutely aware that if I'm unable to make it, uh, you are capable of filling in. And that's not to say like you as in like, hey, grab this guy off the street. I'm saying like another sports fan can do that job. Like, so you could go in and do it. A million people could go in and do it. So I do appreciate the the, the kind words, but ultimately, at least for me, I think that it is sports fans, people who enjoy sports talk, hanging out. And that can mean they're, talking just about sports that could mean they're talking about whatever else they might be talking about. I think the Zolak and Bertrand is an incredible show because there's none of the, and everybody has this habit. So I'm not talking about anyone in particular, but like it's very easy to be doing a show, be it radio or television and be doing a radio or television show and blah, blah, blah. blah and like get all broadcastery. And I, uh, I don't have that club in my bag, really. So I'm more, and, and I, the, the people who are good at that, that, that's fantastic. But I don't think that's as engaging for the average. I think like they want to feel like they're hearing sports people talking about sports. Uh, so that's all to say my preparation is just being a sports fan, watching games, being on Twitter, arguing with people there about sports, talking to my friends about sports. Um, and then on the day of a show, there'll be an email thread where, um, we have great producers. They'll put together a show and we'll, we'll suggest things that we'd like to, to get in the the show. And if, if it's something I really want to get into the show, I'll like be annoying about it to make sure it can get in there because it's so, I mean, anybody could wake up tomorrow, tomorrow morning and program a 50 hour show because there's just so much stuff. So the producers have such a hard job of whittling it down and making sure they can get it. So everyone's voice can be heard. And 
that can be a kind of daunting experience of like trying to get everything you want into a show. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's be a sports fan, uh, communicate well, show up on time and uh, say things that confuse Tom Giles, Giles every now and then just to <laughs> keep him on his toes. <laughs> no, I think you guys got great chemistry, truthfully. I mean, even going back to like Boston sports tonight with, you know, when it was like a four host, you know, that you kind yeah. of did like a four square. Like I thought that that was really interesting. I kind of, you know, when I saw, I watched you guys a lot, you know, it was just interesting to have not always maybe the same person or the same two people. And that's not a knock on Fug or in Holly. I think they're great. Uh, but it was just something a little different that I thought like, wow, not a lot of stations are doing it this way. Or if they are, they're doing it in a different format. Um, and you're just kind of hearing different perspectives was, I thought, I thought it was really fun, but, um, and then obviously Boston sports tonight, you guys are great on there together. Who at work is like, who is your ride or die at work? Like who is like the person you maybe hang out with the most a little bit outside there or a couple of people that you might get together with that you're like kind of really buddies with or friends with off the set? With a bullet, it's Tom Giles. Yeah. He's like truly one of my best friends. I just got back from his bachelor party. Uh, we were there over the weekend. He is truly one of my favorite people in the world. And that's why I absolutely love just like, living life man and like doing things and having jobs and meeting people and stuff because honestly if you took a picture of me and put it next to a picture of tom giles i think that you could make a lot of assumptions about both of us you could say all right well he's probably like at a, a j crew model or something and he probably <laughs> golfs all day and uh whatever you can make assumptions about him most of which are based on how he's just like a, a very sweet handsome man and then with me, I'm afraid of what you would guess, but like you, you probably would not guess, uh, Hey, would get along great with this person. Uh, I was going to say, you'd probably guess that I would annoy that person. And I actually do annoy that person, but that's all to say, like we met at, we'd worked together for a little bit, but we weren't on the air much together. And then, uh, we just hit it off at a holiday party one year. He was like new and he was still freelancing and we just talked for a few minutes and I was like, shoot, I think that guy is going to be one of my best friends. And we've been extremely tight since like, I'm sure, I'm sure I drive him crazy. And I certainly try to push his buttons on <laughs> TV. Like I'll, I'll like mess with him. Like if something's coming up and I need to be reading something like a couple of weeks ago, I like took out my phone and started like taking a video of him or something when like it was about to come to like the camera was about to be on me in like three seconds just to like make him on just to like make him think that I was about to ruin the show. But I never do <laughs> just go up to the line, Brad Marsh on stuff. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, I mean, that's that's great. I and mean, truthfully, you guys do have great like chemistry on TV. I mean, watching you guys, I think, yeah, you can tell sometimes when you like you both are like either trying to give it to each other a little bit yeah. or you're like trying to throw something at them, like a curveball a little bit while you guys are talking. Uh, so I, I appreciate the chemistry. I've said this before, man. There's a lot of people at work. I feel this way about, mm -hmm. I would do a show with him where you just sit us down, turn the microphones and cameras on and just let us go where, mm -hmm. because so many times I'm just getting in the, honestly, I'm getting in the way of whatever show they're trying to do. <laughs> They'll have all these packages and clips and sound bites and everything. And a lot of times I don't need that. A lot of times I'm like, Oh no, no you, you can just give us an hour and we'll get to whatever we need to get to. Um, and I don't mean, I don't mean to say that in like a disruptive way, because again, like there's no harder job than producing a TV show. Actually the only harder job than producing a TV show is producing a TV show that I'm doing, but like, <laughs> Yeah, I would love, like, I honestly, whether it was a podcast or something, I would just sit down with that dude for an hour, press record and, and see what happened. Cause yeah. he's a funny dude, man. He's, he's super funny. And he's, he's kind of been cast as like the straight man. And that breaks my heart. Um, yeah, it, it, it breaks my heart that like, there's a, uh, there, it, uh, it can be, I don't know. I'll just say it's not fair to look at him and think like, oh, okay, well, handsome man, great posture. I bet he's like, insert a lot of like broadcasters like that because he is, he, I, I'm the weirdest person at our <laughs> station. I promise you he's the second weirdest. And I say, and that, that's why I love him. So he can, 
he 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 can get out there too, man. All right, well, it's just that he's next to me, so you can't tell because (laughs) no matter what, no matter what the person next to me is doing, I'm a thousand times weirder than them. I I take I take your word for it. I believe it. I I truthfully do. He's hilarious. So we'll jump we'll jump from Tommy Giles here too. I, I have a great Phil Perry story that I just want to get out there, and 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 I obviously want to hear your opinion about Phil Perry because I feel like those two like you put them next to each other like very similar guys. We're bitter right? rivals. We really don't <laughs> get along. We're always at each other's throats. <laughs> Phil, I'll tell you what. A lot of people. Phil butts heads with everybody. Just a yeah. really mean person. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Phil is like Phil's on the short list. Phil is on the like Kevin O'Connor, Mike Reese. Uh, I don't want to leave anybody out, but like, those are like when people say like, who are the nicest people, Katie Nolan, where you say like, who are like genuinely like the nicest people in this business? Like Phil Perry comes to mind pretty quick. Well, it's funny. So my wife and I went to Patriots training camp. It was like, we got these like all access passes that we were sitting with like the players, families, but also the reporters. And ironically enough, Phil Perry sitting with Mike Reese and they're watching practice and like, you know, all these Just Patriots are nice guy by. contest, super nice guy conversation. Just, right? They're having a compliment battle. <laughs> And, and so I'm like, you know, I'm like geeking out. I'm like, Oh, Phil Perry, I'm like, like Reese, this is great. Like, so I go over and we're talking to him and I ask Phil, my wife and I take a picture of Phil. Now I'm wearing my like steaming Willie beam and t-shirt, you know, and he chats with us for like 15 minutes, super nice talking about his wife. You know, we talk about our t- twin babies that, you know, we, my pat, my dad took for the night. Like, you know, so it was like a really, like we knew him for years. Right. And then a year later, my wife surprises me. So this is now like COVID. So my birthday's in April. So, you know, March, the world shut down. Right. So in April, my wife does these like those cameos. So they get, she gets people, whatever. So she reaches out to who else, but Phil Perry. And she's like, Hey, we met you at the Patriots game, blah, blah, blah. Like, and he remembered everything. So now my wife surprises me with this and we're going video, video. And the last video it's Phil Perry ripping like an all time birthday promo from the front seat of his car. And it went on for like two and a half minutes. And it was just, it was honestly like the coolest thing, you know? And I said to myself, man, what a nice guy. Like, I met him at a Patriots game and, and here he is like ripping a cameo for my birthday, you know, a month into COVID and he was like spot on. Perfect. Unbelievable. That doesn't surprise me at all. That doesn't surprise (laughs) me at all. He's truly one of the, he, I mean, I, I could have lengthy conversations with him. Were it not for the fact that that poor man does not get a second to breathe <laughs> because <laughs> that guy, you want to talk about somebody who like, man, he does everything. He hustles, he grinds, he, man, he's, he's as good as it gets. And then on top of that, like, he's just like an, an incredibly good person. Yeah. And I think like for him, you know, what I, what I find so interesting was like when we were talking, I coach high school football and as soon as I said the you know, high school, you know, the high school that I coached at, he immediately goes, "Oh, Allenton Catholic head football coach used to be Serge Clivio. You had a really good running back in Bernard Lynch. Like he knew everything about. I was like, "Yeah, I was the coordinator on that team. Yeah, you're right." He's like, "That was my first writing gig." He's like, "I covered you guys because you guys were like eight and oh, nine and oh at that point. And, you know, I started to write more about you guys and just like I mean, like I wow. said, just an insanely nice human being. So I'm glad to hear that that's just how he is all the time. You know." Oh yeah. Yeah. When, uh, this is mean, but when, uh, <laughs> when our station, uh, Evan Drellick used to be at our station yep. and our station, uh, didn't renew him or something. It, 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 it ended in a way that like people were, were kind of, it was it just sad to see someone like that go we all got together and like threw him like a going away thing. And it was actually at idle hands. Oh, but wow. <laughs> for some reason, I forget what it was. It was maybe like Evan had his car with him and he did. So we, for some reason, Evan couldn't drink. So we just like me, Giles and Phil just like got drunk in front of him for like <laughs> a, uh, for like our like, Hey, like, we're sorry. We're going to miss you party actually just ended up like, us just drinking in front of him, which probably couldn't, I don't know if I, I, I would have been in a, I would have been in a crap mood if I were Evan. <laughs> Evan's also the best. Yeah. We've had some, man, we've, we've had so many amazing people in, in, in that building. It's, it's pretty crazy. Pretty lucky. 
Yeah. And it's honestly, you guys are really entertaining to watch. I mean, to me, I feel like you have a stranglehold in like local sports just in general. I mean, I, the only sport, local sports, I'm in truthfully, like when I go on and put the TV on, you guys are coming on before ESPN. I feel like when I was younger, I always went to ESPN, ESPN, ESPN. And I just find like, as I learn more about sports and understand sports from different worlds, especially local sports, um, you know, you guys make it just like entertaining to watch, fun to watch. And guys are right a lot, you know, and I think that sometimes when you're wrong, it gets like yeah. blown up, you know, like, oh, they're wrong about this and wrong about that. But you don't hear all the times that you guys are right a lot, too. And, and tell I you think, what, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll tell you. How, how come no one celebrates the genius that was saying when everyone was saying I, I give I get in fights with current about this or I used to um, when everybody was saying like, oh, wait, do you see how many teams want Tom Brady? He's surprised by how many teams are interested in him. And I was only one jerk over here was saying, let's actually wait and see. Let's see how many teams are actually interested in him. And ended up being two. No one rightfully so, because everybody's like pro Brady. Nobody right. was like, whoa, great job, DJ nailed that but it was probably because i was obnoxious about it yeah it is crazy when you think about that there were only like two teams too because chargers and bucks man crazy. and i remember even the, at one point the raiders were in i remember reading something from um mayock basically or gruden being like yeah we assessed the film and we decided to whatever move in a different direction they signed Mariota like, the first minute of free agency yeah like i thought it was kind of crazy you know and so so I'll jump into this because I, I asked this question to people when Brady was 40 years old. And I said, if Brady's going to play till 45, like he says, would you build a team around him for five years? Now I'm going to ask you this question a little differently is Brady's 45. If Brady gave the guarantee, I'm going to play till I'm 50. Would you build a team around him for five years? Yes. And here's why. I love it. I agree. The I agree. I know that, and I've had this conversation with Michael Hurley, who oddly enough, we're on like, we're on different sides of this Brady argument, but not in the ways that you would think. You would think that I would be like, eh, I'm going to make some jokes about Tom Brady because people get really mad when you make fun of Tom Brady. Uh, <laughs> and he would be very pro Tom Brady. I think that Brady can play until he's 50. And he thinks counting on that is insane because he correctly, like he really is at this point, one injury away. Like if Agreed. that, if 2008 happens again, like, it is He's for real it. done. Um, but the reason I say, yes, I would is because, I mean, if you're building a team around Tom Brady, what does that mean? Really? It means you're loading up the offensive line and receivers. So if Tom Brady goes kaput and you haven't been drafting that young quarterback or doing whatever, aren't we seeing now that the NFL is becoming a little more like the NBA, whether it's teams like the Rams that say F them picks, or quarterback movement right. time was Jake Plummer going from the Cardinals to the Broncos was like a crazy thing. They were like, could you believe a starting quarterback went to free agency and then signed with the team? And then like bit by bit, it's like, all right, you know what? Chargers choose, choose uh, Drew Brees, or I'm sorry, Philip Rivers over Drew Brees. All right. So Brees is out there now. Culpepper's out there now. Weird, kind of the quarterbacks are starting to move around. You got Kirk Cousins going, signing a fully guaranteed deal. It's gotten to the point now where it, it's it's not like LeBron's NBA type of thing, but quarterbacks do move. So if you build a team for Tom Brady and Tom Brady goes kaput and you say, oh, shoot, now we're a team with an offensive line in weapons and we don't have a young quarterback that will breathe down someone's throat, wouldn't you think that, the Deshaun Watson of that year or the Russell Wilson of that year will say, Oh, give me, I want to go right. there. So maybe, so maybe you could just get the next guy. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting because it's like you, you when you probably asked that question when he was 40, you could arguably give the same exact answer. Right. And then here yeah. it is five years later and probably got cheated out of NFL MVP. In my opinion, I think that's, I think he did, you know, uh, he was close. He was, I actually wanted him to win MVP because uh, another one of my takes was Brady's not going to be that good here, but if he goes someplace else, he's going to bust his ass and he's going to have a team. He's going to be on a loaded team and uh, win MVP. It did annoy me that when he went to the Super Bowl last year with the bucks, everybody was like, see, he's doing it. Look what he's doing. He's bringing them there. And I'm like, fellas are uh, ladies and gentlemen, are we watching these games? Like the defense is absolutely carrying him. And He's playing so so. I was relieved when he played well in the Super Bowl because if he had a bad Super Bowl too, and then won, the takes would have been nauseating. 
Right. And then he, should he be, should he really still be playing? Has he lost it? Like, is he a liability mm. next year? Like, right. Like all that stuff. Right. Mm. Um, I'm interested in your take on this because I'm noticing a start in the trend in football a little bit. And I just, I'm interested to see what you think. And I know they've talked about it on your channel before, but um, the idea of quarterbacks then going in the draft the following year after you draft a quarterback and really trying to go get a weapon that they're familiar with in college. I mean, you see it in Cincinnati, you're seeing it with all the Alabama quarterbacks, you're mm-hmm. now seeing it with Cobb and Devontae Adams coming together. Yeah. So, you know, is that a trend that you think is going to start happening more? And you mentioned NBA a little bit, but almost kind of like picking the team that you want to go to or signing these receivers for four years, knowing that you might trade them after two years and they want to go somewhere where they're like, do you think that that's a huge trend that's going to start happening in football? If done well, sure. Like if the receiver is Jamar chase, then I might even draft a bad quarterback. If it can somehow help me get Jamar chase, if that's like his teammate or if it's Devontae Adams. But I mean, if, and obviously uh, Mac, Mac Jones played with every good receiver prospect ever because he went to Alabama. Yeah. If, if the guy they're going after whoever it is from Alabama is a stud, then sure. You should want to get him anyway. The chemistry thing definitely helps. But I think that if I like the idea though, like later in rounds and like the later rounds anyway, just like going to your young quarterback being like, Hey, who is your favorite receiver? Okay. We'll draft him see if any chemistry can uh, can make its way. But otherwise, like if there's, I mean, if your guy went to like NC State and there's like a second round prospect, I'm not taking him in the first round to make sure that you're teaming them up. I, th- I think you still got to go with the guy that you think will fit your system best. Yeah, and I think it's, I think it's maybe an SEC thing at the end of the day. Like, you know, yeah. that these quarterbacks are that good. These receivers are that good, especially at those two schools alone. Uh, it, that is really interesting. Also, um, I'll say yeah. on, uh, quickly on the Raiders, I don't know which teams from the AFC West are making the playoffs, but I'm pretty sure the Raiders are one of them. I think that the people are kind of sleeping on the Raiders, if it's possible to sleep on an AFC West team right now. Yeah. And I think that that's the most, that could be overnight became really the most difficult uh, division in football. Oh yeah. That's a buzzsaw. Like I, I'm a, I don't know if you can see in my shot. I'm a, I'm a chargers fan and man, Max Crosby absolutely killed Justin Herbert. And in that week's uh, in that week, 18 game. And uh, they, they went out, the chargers did, they loaded up their defense. They fixed a lot of their problems and Justin Herbert's probably feeling, well, at least I got a defense now. Okay. And then the Raiders get Chandler Jones to put on the other side. I would have that poor guy, man. I think the Raiders are going to be awesome. Yeah. And getting that extra pass rusher is just, especially a guy again, familiar, familiar with that whole Patriots or I guess with behind McDaniels too. Mm -hmm. Um, So just to you, like, and I'm just more curious, like outside of who you are, the sports personality, I mean, I I see on your Instagram a lot, you're into music and you play the guitar really well. I mean, who are you a little bit outside here? What are some of your interests and maybe even aspirations moving forward of what you want to become? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a podcast called brunch. Uh, that's a pop culture podcast. I do a lot of like movie review stuff. I do that on some of the other NBC channels. Um, I love music. I can talk about it all day. Love playing it and just endlessly fascinated by it. Uh, honestly, I just want to create things and I want to do things that are engaging. And I'm fortunate that a lot of the things I do for work kind of check those boxes. I want to like, and my work knows this. I'm probably not the best person for reading you highlights or giving you a box score or something. And I don't necessarily want to do that. I want to be the person that has a conversation about it and says, I mean, it was very nice of you to say earlier that like, says something that maybe everybody else wouldn't say. And that's because I'm probably not as smart as everybody else, but like, uh, I, I, I like that. I'm not the same as, um, that I, I I'm not like what you would think of when you think sports television personality or even television personality. But I mean, as far as aspirations go, uh, I love what I'm doing now. 
I just want to keep making things. I love interviewing people. Uh, I'm probably going to try to get more involved in like the social media side of it. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's my way of saying I probably need to start a fucking TikTok at some point or whatever. Everyone uh, tells me the start one. Like everybody, I just feel like, am I going to be like that older dude on TikTok? That <laughs> like I made one. Like, what? <laughs> I made one because there's an Olivia Rodrigo song, and the lyrics are, "I bet she knows Billy Joel because you played her Uptown Girl." I bet you even tell her. chorus in the verse so i made a tiktok explaining that uptown girl goes right from the chorus into the back into the verse so there's no time to say i love you to somebody during that because it because she thinks i'm not so tough just because i'm in love with the up and then it's back in the verse so i made a tiktok explaining that that olivia arrigo lyric was bullshit and <laughs> all of the comments are were like children being like not this man saying blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yep, sorry, my bad. I'll, I, I'll go. It is I crazy. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fifth grade teacher and like my students are always like, do you have TikTok? I would try looking you up on TikTok because they know I have this podcast. <laughs> I'm on YouTube you. and it's crazy. I'm like, no, I don't have TikTok. No, I don't. And this is exactly why I don't have it, you know? And I mean, I've even had like, ish, like nowadays in school i feel like a lot of the issues come more from social media than ever and tiktok is one of those things now that yeah. like, there's more issues because of that than anything else and you i don't even know how to deal with it because i'm like i don't even know what this is yeah you, know? you <laughs> it's truly one of the things where when you're a kid and an adult says to you hey trust me i've been there before and you say oh you don't know what you're talking about because you can't imagine that that adult was ever a kid right you are a fucking lying if you say you've been there before <laughs> with any of these things. This is the first generation that is going through this. Right. It's insane. It's Poor scary. Kids. It is yeah. scary. Um, and then the last question I'll just ask you, you know, just like, and I ask my coaches this question a lot, and, and I'll flip it to what you do. Um, what's your advice to young people looking to crack into what you do? Like, you know, you mentioned just like having a personality, and that's what I appreciate about you. I think that that's what's so important is that everything's getting covered nowadays so differently. Like with a mm -hmm. cell phone, like if I go on max preps or I go on all these high school things that I follow, the best footage or the most views, the things that get the most likes are taken right from your cell phone on the sideline, in the stands, catching something unique. And it's not this like beautiful high def, like whatever. Right. And, and that's what I find so amazing about like sports nowadays and covering that. What would be your advice to people who are cracking into it and just, just how to do it? Do it your way. And that, that's not saying be stubborn, but like do what you think you can do. Like, th like think of like whatever job you want to have or however you like, just fucking make it up and do it. Look at Jared Carabas. That right. guy is the undisputed face of baseball. And it's because he's just a fucking diehard <laughs> baseball fan. Who's a super cool, funny dude. And he liked making jokes about baseball and do, and just like breathlessly talking about it and relentlessly covering it. And a way he could have done it would have been the traditional route that like I took. I went to, I got a journalism degree. I interned at WEI.com. I started writing. I was a beat reporter. I worked up my contacts. I worked up my interviewing skills and everything. He was just himself the whole way. And I'm not saying that I did it the wrong way, but I, I am saying the way that he did it works. Look at Tyler Milliken. I don't know if you know who that is. He's a producer for, um, for Zolak and Bertrand. And he's a kid. And I am this kid's biggest fucking fan because he's <laughs> so clearly just doing it his way. Like very much in a, hey, look, I wouldn't be able to do it your way if I tried. And I, I can kind of identify with people when I see them like that because like I was saying with, with my work, I'm sure I could put on a voice and say like, Hey, welcome into the program. We're going to discuss the Celtics have what it takes. We'll be right back. I can't right, really right. do that. <laughs> or I, if I did, I feel like there would be uh, some like artifice there. Yeah. So I have such respect for people because it's scary to just try to fucking do it in a way that has no playbook. Like Carabas, like is a pioneer in many ways. And I know whenever I talk about Jared Carabas, I sing his praises like crazy. And it sounds like he's like paying me to do it or something, but I really can't stress <laughs> enough. 
this is a thing that has been done the same way for so many years. And he really kind of just ignored that and was I and just believed in himself. And I'm sure he had a lot of people who believed in him and that probably helped him uh, a, a lot too, but shit, like do it your way, take advice. And if people say like, Hey, look, you're long winded or this, like those are things that you could probably work on. But as far as like your personality and how you do it, be you. And if somebody doesn't like it, then everything can be valid. Like if, if, if you're working at a place and you think they're good and they don't think you are, but you really think that like you're onto something respect that they, that like, you're not their cup of tea, but understand like, okay, that doesn't, that, but they're not to quote the bagel boss guy. Like <laughs> they're not God. Cause I'm, I'm sure I, I know this for a fact. I was trying to get Jared Carabas on WEI back in the day and they were dragging their feet and they were hemming and hawing and everything. And I just knew that they were wrong. And I'm sure that Jared knew that they were wrong too. So don't get discouraged in that way. That's yeah. uh, be, be Jared Carabas. That's a, that's a, that's the best and worst advice I could give. To you might've just created a t-shirt right there. Yeah. Be Jared Carabas. <laughs> I'm sure if Jared heard that, he'd be like, don't tell anybody to be me. <laughs> like, don't, they, they, they don't want this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that that's that's really great advice because cracking into this, you know, the, I'm kind of doing everything the way that I want, you know, and some people are like, oh, yeah. you should do this or oh, you should do that. But you know what, like things got to fit who you are and sometimes molding into something to to be what you want to be is you're not as good at it because you're yeah. not. And that's what I find so unique about you. I think like watching you and like listening to you, I don't think you just like always want to go with like the same take or talk about the same exact perspective of a take. Like you're always looking at something from a different angle. You're always looking at something to kind of be able to bounce and throw back and be and like, if it's, well, if it's yeah. going down a road too, I feel comfortable doing this with Giles, not as comfortable doing it with other with like my, my other coworkers because I don't want to like fuck up their thing. If I fuck something up with Giles, then it's like, well, it's my and Giles show. So whatever we fucked it up. We, I, the only person that gets embarrassed is me. But like, if I feel that something's going down a road, that's obvious. And like, we're just going to say something that anybody could have fucking said. And that we've already said a million times. Right. I'll like lightly change the subject or I'll like pivot it a little bit. I won't say, okay, let's talk about Bruins. That one's out of Patriots, but I'll just be like, okay, well then, what about this? Giles is good at that too. Like we don't want to do the, I mean, we had the pandemic, man, quarantine. We, for technical purposes, among other reasons, we did the same fucking show about Jarrett Stidham. I was, Jared Stidham you know, I wasn't going to say it. I was, but day. let's talk and like, about it. <laughs> nobody wanted to be like that, but that's just the, that, that that's the way it had to be because our hands were tied in so many ways. Yeah. We were doing the best job that we could, but after the shows, we'd be like, well, hopefully I was able to put like a, a nice different coat of paint on Jared Sidham because we were, everything was remote. We were in zoom. People couldn't get in the building and everything like our poor producers. It was just, it was so tough to do those shows and it killed me. Like it, it, it seriously killed me to, uh, to <laughs> that, that, that we were in that spot and it was nobody's yeah. fault other than the pandemic, but man, those were. That's, that's where I was like, man, that that's where like, I would have loved for it to have been, Hey, just press record and let us go. Because like, I was so jealous. Zolak and Bertrand, they were doing shows about fucking pickles, man. They were talking about <laughs> like, they were talking about everything, but we, we like had to do like a real show and can't do a real show on pickles. <laughs> Right. And, and honestly, that's like how I started. I started during the pandemic. So for me, it was like, I had that freedom to kind of talk about whatever I wanted to talk about and didn't have to talk about the same thing over and over again, because all these coaches are looking for a platform to talk about, you know, what they're doing maybe on zoom or how they're preparing their players on like their huddle app or their film apps or whatever. So I, I totally get it. And for you guys, you had to be creative in ways too, as it kept going and going and going. But yeah, I remember those weeks. It was what was that? Um, Carson Palmer's brother. What, it was a Jordan Palmer. Oh yeah. yeah. Talking about, Oh yeah. He's better than any quarterback. I'm like, get what dude? Like you just try so to that's get on where, TV like, So right like, now? I call that out in real time. I was like, current, I love you. And you're having th 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 who you would want to talk to somebody who worked with Jared Stidham. Like right. you do want to get his perspective, but 
we're all going to take that with a grain of salt when he says that he's like the most pro ready quarterback or whatever he was saying. And now in Curran's defense, Curran wasn't like taking that as gospel either. I don't think, I think he was just merely having a guest on his podcast, but that guest happened to say something that uh, none of us believed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's at- interesting. Like, cause like even in, in find that look, what I love was like when Phil Perry did, like he was having a podcast with like coordinators or like safety coaches. I, I thought mm-hmm. that was like smart and really cool. Um, like, and, and I kind of stole, I reached out to Kyle Duggar's um, defensive oh, back cool. coach in college and he agreed to come on and he was a tremendous coach himself, but him showing me film of him a little bit and then getting that little talk of like, Hey, what teams were like really interested in him? And the one thing he said to me that like really stood out was he's like, you know, the Patriots came, and we, we talked to them, you know, as average or maybe even less than most teams. And he's like, I thought he was going to Buffalo bills. And all I was going to say, boom. everybody thought he was going to the bills. Yeah. yeah. And, and My friend is funny. a big bills fan and he was devastated when the Patriots took him. And it was just funny because I mean, he would fit the bills. Like I feel like secondary, like he fits that pro. Oh, yeah. It's like big physical tough. Like yeah. I could see him playing well, very well there in that defense. Uh, yeah. But yeah. I think he was a steal, but I get it. Like you, you gotta be innovative. And I think that, you know, yeah, that Stidham was tough, but I felt like you guys, I thought I you guys promise though, like, you're right. Like we do have to be innovative, probably to the point of being annoying. Like I promise I try <laughs> like I it's it, it man like it, it it can be difficult when there's like stretches where there aren't games or something like that or I mean to take the quarantine thing out of it like it I think everybody did the best they could in every field and anything as, right as far as like, that was like insane that that factually should not have been happening in the world like that that like yeah. like the, the, i would not have thought that in 2020 that, that like a pandemic could still happen you know like it was crazy so right. i so take that out of it it can be like there are like dog days of summer or whatever where it's like okay well shoot there's nothing to talk about what do we talk about i will always be down to try to get weird and get creative with it okay. and that's again like Zolak and Bertrand, man, I have so much respect for them, that, that, that whole crew, because they'll do the thing of, they'll talk about sports. Like it, they're not going to miss a sports story to talk about whatever nonsense they talk about. But sometimes we as humans do talk about nonsense. And I think that sports radio listeners or sports television viewers are also interested in that stuff. Giles and I did a, a betting segment about the Oscars, because if you bet on sports, maybe you also want to bet on the Oscars. So like right. shit like that. I don't know, man. I it drives a I'm, different audience in, right? Like, yeah. I mean, it really does. You know, when I did this, like, I looked at my analytics and it was like eighty percent male, twenty percent female. I'm like, all right, how do I get female listeners up? You know, and then you dabble and do other things and you try other things that are maybe a little off topic from what you're covering, but you can still have that same conversation and same coverage, like you said with the Oscars. And I think it's it's genius. It gets other people drawn to you a little bit. Hopefully, man. We try. We try. (laughs) Well, listen, I want to thank you for coming on here today. I know you have a pretty busy schedule. So to be able to make this work and honestly, like meeting you at idle hands, like just a straight up dude, very cool, came right over. We had a half hour conversation and it was like, you you know, it's you were just like this average person. But when I see you on TV, I think you're funny. Like to me, I was like, when you walked, I was like, is that DJ Bean? Is that DJ? Well, dude, I mean, (laughs) the night we met was funny. It just shows how like I don't think I would have been able to do that even like 10 years ago. Uh, I, I was by myself there. I was supposed to go. There was an event at idle hands. I was going and uh, my brother-in-law was going and at the last second uh, he couldn't make it. And I was on my way anyway. And I have a friend who works at idle hands and I was like, well, it's an event. I want to be there for it. Um, And I want to see my friend and I want to like show support or whatever. So I got there and I was like the guy at the bar that's just like (laughs) there by himself. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to get a beer and socialize, which I don't know. Again, like 10 years ago, I would have thought that was like an insane move or like a loser move or whatever, but shoot, man, I go to the movies by myself and that's the most fun I have. But yeah, like I just started chatting you and your buddy up and it was, uh, 
awesome time. We talked about sports. We talked about life. It was awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. So I, I appreciate this a lot. And again, I look forward to, to continue watching you. And if you guys don't pay attention to him, look at his Instagram. It's like D a zillion E's J so many E's. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, uh, just a cool follow, but again, pay attention to him. Um, and, and you guys will enjoy him for sure. So uh, from beyond podcast, I'm your host, Anthony Petrella's DJ bean till next time.